Tonight's story is about how my family used to be a bunch of moochers. I grew up among the Michigan Dutch, who are known for being very thrifty. Everyone had last names like Redvoods, or Sluices, and Vander whatevers. All of the beaches were 20 yards from a windmill or a wooden shoe factory. Everything was clean all of the time. I had no idea the rest of the world was so filthy. Our bathrooms at Burger King didn't even have water on the counters because there was always a tall, blue-eyed Dutch teen paid to wipe them down every 20 minutes. My dad supported his family of six on $30,000 a year from the church. His father was a plumber and electrician who worked at Consumer Powers Electric Company. His mother knew how to bake and sew. My mom's parents owned a kitchen and bath store chain. And with the combined efforts of both sides, we were able to cobble together a middle-class life. Occasionally, we hit the road so my dad could speak to Midwest churches about the evil of teenage dancing and the reason why Democrats will never see the kingdom of heaven. Motels were a luxury when traveling. If we stayed in one, it usually had some form of the word economy worked into its name. Econo Inge conjures up a dirty, seedy image in mind, but you couldn't beat the deal. 30 bucks got you free HBO, which my parents promptly blocked, and an indoor pool my sisters and I promptly peed. On the plus side, the Econo staff provided the ubiquitous continental breakfast that included a basket of grapefruits and oatmeal as binding as a notarized signature. Instead of an Econo Inn, we usually mooched off of a family of strangers in the sponsoring church, which prepared me well for life in the arts, for sleeping in my car, for drinking water from a hose in the back alley of roll em up smoke shop and liqueurs. I know the value menu of every fast food chain. I've remained dirt poor my whole adult life. I know the inside of a Dollar Tree the way a dog knows the inside of his haunches. On a business trip to Nashville, I thought it might be nice to stay with an old work buddy from the Inspiration House, the Christian music store we both worked at. So, I called up Ed. Sure, he said with uncertainty in his voice. This confused me. Only a few years ago, I had helped pack boxes in his Lantana, Florida living room, and he had specifically said, Dan, if you're ever in the Nashville area, please come stay with us. I'd taken him at his word just as I do the Lord. The problem was, Ed's mousy wife, Carrie, never liked me. Ed greeted me at the door with a hug. Carrie was cordial, but not elated by my presence. When he suggested we go out for dinner, she peeked at the wall clock. 740. Uh, I'm not sure anything will be open. By the time we get there, it'll be 8. She frowned paralyzing an expression that would remain on her face for the rest of my stay. Ed suggested that special pizza place they frequented every year on their anniversary. Fine, she shrugged. Seated at an Italian dive owned and operated by three Finnish gals, we split a medium mushroom pizza. Ed and I swapped stories of our days in Christian retail. We recalled the rude and nasty customers we used to serve. We remembered the sweet ones we loved. We gossiped about our former colleagues and shared a lot of laughs. Carrie picked the mushrooms from her slice. You know what, Ed said, seizing the bill. I think this one's on us. His wife rolled her eyes and mumbled something indecipherable. Are you sure? You don't have to, I said. Ed gave the waitress $12. Tell you what, you leave the tip and we'll call it even. We were home by 9.30, and Cherry made it clear that socializing time was over. I was shown the guest room. I vacuumed in here, Ed said, and Cherry moved her sewing machine. Thanks, I said, giving a swift yank to the height of Ed that wanted to remain that way. Ed left to find bedding. I tried and tried to open the couch. It was becoming crystal clear that my presence was an imposition to this bed and to Cherry. I had interrupted their routine. He had paid for my pizza, and she had moved her damn sewing machine. I heard noise from the shower in the adjoining bathroom. 
She was singing praise and worship tunes loudly, probably washing my evil from her pale skin. Ed entered and handed me a set of sheets. Here goes. All set. It was uh, 20 degrees in their house. Ed explained that they didn't run the heat until mid-December to keep the electric bill reasonable. Shivering, I asked for maybe, like, a blanket or something? My friend looked like I had asked him for something very specific and difficult to find, like a nine-inch springform cake pan. Uh, I'll ask the wife, was his response. He ran to the bathroom door and asked Cherry where the blankets were kept. Minutes later, he returned with a thin throw. I thanked him and said good night. He went to his bedroom where he crawled under a mass of down-filled quilts. I, on the other hand, shuddered from the bitter temperature. Near the window, a draft invaded the room, making the cold colder. I lay on the bed and pulled the throw over me. It was about four feet by four feet. By three in the a.m., my lips were blue from frostbite. The throw wasn't doing anything, so I took everything in my suitcase and tried to layer up. Two undershirts three pairs of socks and khakis pulled over a pair of jeans. I even wore the wide part of my tie around my neck as a scarf. Still, I was freezing, so I opened the closet looking for something to warm me up. There were no space heaters to be found, but I hit the jackpot with an old wedding gift, an iron still in the original box. I plugged it in and pressed it against my inner thigh for warmth. It was wonderful getting my vitals back. I finally got sleepy and unplugged it. Within minutes, I went back to freezing. I thought about plugging the iron back in and igniting the house fire, dreaming of the warmth it would provide. At 4 in the a.m., I was wide awake again, so I went back to the storage closet looking for any kind of cloth, a beach towel, raincoats, grandmother knit doilies, Anything I could place over my body for survival, I was really that cold. There wasn't one piece of fabric to be found, with the exception of Cherry's bridal gown wrapped in plastic. Some people are downright rude and inhospitable, like Cherry, for instance. I won't soon forget her dramatic cries the next morning. For someone wound so tightly, she sure did know how to cuss up a storm when she let herself into the guest room in the morning and discovered me warm and cozy, the upper half of my body wrapped in her wedding veil, the lower half wrapped in her white dress. She was angry and never forgave me. Or maybe she did. I've never seen her again, so I don't know. It's true there was no good reason why I had her wedding pumps on. Mom and Dad were regular middle-class American folk living on a modest income. Being a youth pastor's son had its obvious downsides. Nearly everything in the world was a sin, especially things that began with the letter D. Here's a list. Denim, wearing it in church school. Darn dang, using those euphemisms. Denominations, any Christian denomination that's not Baptist. Disco, dancing, Debbie Gibson, Discs, comma, compact. Debate, Darwin, comma, Charles. Divorce, disease, mainly AIDS. Dalai Lama, doomsday cults. Delinquent gum chewing. Deconversion. Depravity, comma, total. In other words, not believing in the total depravity of man. There were big upsides, though, to being an influential pastor's son, like getting all that free production help. People had to do stuff for me, or God would be mad at them. Even our road trips were free. We always borrowed a van from a member of our church wanting to get into God's good graces, and we slept cheap in the van at a highway rest stop or in a tent at a KOA campground. More often, we stayed for free in the home of a family from a sponsoring church that had booked my dad as a speaker with a message from the Lord. But you never knew what to expect when pulling into the driveways of strangers. The Grey Bear family was the most memorable disaster in our long journey of mooching. 
Their home could be described as a pigsty, but that would be unfair to both pigs and homes and styes. The Grey Bears were of Cherokee descent, yet they powerfully shattered all stereotypes of dignified Native Americans who want nothing more to dance with wild animals and live peaceably in nature. These were Native Americans who had converted to Christianity and were therefore, quote, safe people, end quote, with which to associate. Welcome aboard the Grey Bear Express, John Grey Bear shouted enthusiastically upon the night of our arrival. Let's get you a tour. He introduced us to his wife, Mrs. John Grey Bear, a few rascally sons, and baby Grey Bear, a naked girl who wore nothing but graham cracker crumbs and a permanent scowl. He started in the bathroom, explaining the trick to the toilet. The chain's broken, so to flush. Submerge your arm in the tank and give the plug a yank. In case we forgot, the rhyme was taped to the head. You can furnish an entire house if you have buddies at the salvage yard. In the hallway, he stood in front of an old map and commenced a history lesson about his grandfather's involvement with Custer's last stand. Too tired to stand, I leaned against the wall and dreamed of eating custard. Mrs. John Graybear took note of my weary body language and became sympathetic. John, these kinfolk are exhausted from the trip. Let's give them time to unpack. It was obvious John Graybear didn't appreciate being interrupted by the wife, as he obnoxiously called her. He frowned, then made a fist, and pretended to backhand her. She flinched and sauntered away. John laughed and rolled his eyes with the good old-fashioned charm of a wife-beater. My family exchanged knowing glances from my dad to my mom to me and Sarah to young Rachel and Becky. It was as if we were all thinking the same thing. This family makes our family look healthy. Over the next few hours, the impish son set fire to the recycling bin in the garage and baby Grey Bear sucked on the dog's chew toy. We walked down to the cellar where my youngest sisters would sleep. John pointed to a hide a bed normally occupied, at, normally occupied by Coughball, the family cat and her litter of nine. She had those sweet kitties last Saturday, explained John. Some of them were stillbirth, so if you see a dead one, chuck it. We shuddered, but it explained the smell. We whispered, to eight-year-old Rachel and five-year-old Becky and left them alone in the dampened basement with the cats. In the living room, my parents were handed an air mattress and a pump. John pointed to an electrical outlet and my dad began to inflate. Mrs. John Graybear entered with some urine-stained sheets. Bedding? The host said good night and left us alone to mock them. Mom, Dad, Sarah, and I began to bond over the bizarre situation of staying in this house. What did we expect, being so cheap we couldn't or wouldn't pay for a motel? Within 20 minutes, my parents dropped the adult pretense and giddily channeled their inner teen selves. It was one of those moments when everything became funny. There were no lines between what was appropriate and what was not. There were no maturity differences between adult and teen. We were ridiculing and deriding the Grey Bears in their own home, beneath a ceiling fan that inexplicably dripped maple syrup. While Mom braved the bathroom, Sarah and I bounced on an air mattress. When Mom returned, we invited her to flop down on the bed between us. Are you kidding? Mom asked before uttering the funniest thing she's ever said. If I jumped on that air mattress, the two of you would hit the ceiling like rag dolls. We laughed until tears flowed. The four of us took turns sneaking around the house, going on a scavenger hunt for unusual items. When Dad returned from the kitchen with utter balm for utter and teats, we snorted and chuckled so hard we rolled off the air mattress. That earned him ten points. Sarah tied the game, however, when she returned from the bathroom, clutching a bar of soap from the shower. It was covered in mud and grease. Dirty soap. She deadpanned. Is that an oxymoron? It was a mammoth struggle to keep from laughing too loudly. Even though the original plan had called for staying two nights with the Grey Bears, the next morning there was no question as to whether 
or not we could survive another 24 hours. As the sun rose, we threw our stuff in the car and checked out of the reservation, which we had insensitively named it. It was a night we would never, ever forget. And my little sisters won't let us. Their hair still stinks of dead kitty.